Hi everyone, my name's John Swaddle. I'm a professor here in the biology department, and I'm an ecologist. This is not an anonymous ecologist meeting, by the way. And what an ecologist means is that I study how animals interact with each other and their environment. And what I'm gonna talk about today is trying to solve a problem with a new technology based on how birds think and hear and see the world that solves a problem that is centuries old. So what I'm gonna talk about is not just about how beautiful birds are, we all know that. Ask any pe strutting peacock and he will tell you how beautiful he is. Birds are also culturally important, for example, the bald eagle, and they're also incredibly biologically important. They are the heartbeat in many ecosystems, which means if you remove birds, you affect lots of things in the environment. They are the literal canary in the coal mine. They're also very economically important. About one in five of adult Americans engage in some kind of bird watching activity, which is then tremendously economically important for the country. But birds also create problems, and that's what I'm here to talk about. So this is a photo that I took on my way into the Sadler Center, so anyone with that license plate, you might want to move your car. So birds, we know, destroy property. They damage buildings. They can also destroy infrastructure. I used to live on the south side of Chicago, as you can tell by my accent, and <laughs> birds would routinely nest in power lines and cause brownouts. Um, so we know that they can cause large inconveniences, but they're also dangerous. Some birds spread diseases directly to humans. Many birds carry vectors of disease, like our friendly tick. Thankfully, this is not to scale. <laughs> but many of the spread of diseases from Central and South America to North America are probably because birds are carrying the ticks that carry those diseases. So knowing where birds are and understanding where they are are very medically important too as well. Unfortunately, birds also collide with aircraft, which is not good for the aircraft or for the birds. And in many situations, they can bring aircraft down. You might know the story of the miracle on the Hudson from a few years ago where the pilot very skillfully landed his plane in the middle of the Hudson, and that was because a Canada goose hit his plane. So it can bring planes down, it can cause fatalities, but also creates billions of dollars worldwide of damages and delays to civil, commercial, and military aviation. They also can destroy crops. So this is a picture of several hundred starlings over a field in the Midwest, devastating the crops. So we also know that some birds can also be a huge pest in agriculture and cause tremendous damages. In the US, those are largely economic damages. In sub-Saharan Africa, that can cost lives. This is a picture of a flock of red-billed quelia, which is a small weaver bird about that big, which in East Africa, they call the flying locust or the feathered locust because these birds can come in and destroy crops of wheat, rice, and maize. And for subsistence farmers, that is their livelihood. That's their only source of income and their only source of food in many situations. So it costs lives to have these birds come through. So lots of people have been interested in how can we get rid of these birds, at least stop them doing these kinds of damages. And there have been many people who've thought about this for several centuries. And the major techniques that people use are either to try to scare the birds away. This is a picture of a propane cannon, which is popular right now, just sets off huge noises in a field, disturbs everybody, including the birds. But birds are smart. They soon learn that that toothless boom has no consequence for them and they come back. In fact, you could probably do a YouTube search for propane cannon starling and you'll see videos of a propane cannon going off, starlings leaving and then coming straight back within 10 seconds and feeding on the dead insects that have been created by that sonic boom. <laughs> People have also been poisoning birds, but unfortunately when you poison birds, you also poison other things. Very ecologically damaging in many situations, and so not preferred in most situations. And also, people don't like spraying poisons on their grapes and their fruit, knowing that people are then gonna go eat those things. So poisons have limited effects. They also are not very good at actually reducing the number of birds in the local area. So we're approaching this from a very different point of view, but a point of view that we found completely by accident. 
which is the best scientific story to tell. Something you did wrong actually leads to something decent. So what we were doing was looking in these Australian birds called zebra finches. This is the male and this is the female. They're very lovey-dovey. They're unusual, especially for Australians, that they mate for life. I should say for Australian birds, sorry. Um, <laughs> it's okay, one of my brothers lives in Australia, so I can get away with that. Um, they mate for life, and we wanted to know why. What influences their social bonds, their connection with each other? And we were doing some experiments to see what they pay attention to in each other. And part of that, we played white noise in the background because we wanted them to focus on visual information and not auditory, acoustic information, sound. What we found was when we played white noise in the room, this broke up the pairs. They divorced each other, basically, because of the noise. And this was a very novel finding. It was accidental, but then it led to a whole series of studies on noise pollution. How does sound in the environment affect the behavior, ecology, fitness consequences for birds? And what we found through lots of different studies, including of the very charismatic eastern bluebird that we have all over this area of the, of the US, is that noise has very significant effects. So a noisy area, noise introduced by humans, not the beautiful music that you just heard, but the noise of traffic and buildings and machinery, that disturbs the birds so much that their breeding goes down. The number of babies they have goes down because of noise. They also change their song. So most human noise is low and rumbling. It's like a low-pitched traffic type of noise. And birds sing at a higher pitch, a higher frequency. And when they're exposed to this traffic, they sing even higher. And that has consequences for males, at least in bluebirds, because high-pitched sound is not preferred by females. So talking like this as a bluebird is not as good as talking like this as a bluebird. And obviously, it works as a human, too, as well. <laughs> so there are big consequences of responding to the sound in the environment. And then I read a really pivotal study. It was actually a series of studies by a guy called Clinton Francis, who was a PhD student and a friend of mine at UC Boulder, who did this wonderful large-scale sound manipulation experiment where he collaborated with an energy company to turn the gas compressors off and on on this 100, 100 acre site, only manipulating the sound in the environment and nothing else. And what he found was when this noise was on, some birds completely left the area. And one of the birds that left the area almost entirely was this pinion jay. Now this pinion jay is important because it eats the seeds of the pinion pine and then, as happens with biology, what goes in comes out, and that fertilizes and spreads the seeds around the area. And so when you lose pinion jays, you also lose pinion pines. So the sound itself completely restructured the ecosystem, even changing the types of trees that there are in the system. It not only changed the birds, it changed everything the birds interact with, including the plants and trees. So the sound-affected areas had fewer trees, which is amazing. So we wanted to use our own studies and then this sort of revelation through Clint's work to use sound as a way of removing pest birds from an area. So I started collaborating with another scientist here, Mark Hinders, in our applied science department. He's an acoustic engineer and a physicist. Of ways of having spatially controlled sounds through very directional speakers that were designed to stop birds from hearing each other. And if they don't hear each other, they don't like being there, as I'll sort of show you a little bit. I'm a scientist, so I have to show you data, otherwise I will wither and die. So <laughs> I will have a couple of data graphs. This is a sort of preemptive warning for anyone who has to steal themselves for it. The speakers we used were sort of known technology. These are speakers that you might see in a museum in front of an exhibit where you want to hear the sound associated with that exhibit right here, but not as you're in front of another exhibit. And so we're using these kinds of speakers, called parametric speakers, to control sound into specific areas and then broadcasting sounds that we know that are the right pitch to stop birds from hearing each other, from communicating with each other. And then using this in various different conditions to see if we can long-term remove these pest birds from places where we know that they cause problems. And so that's what we've been doing. We started working with European starling, which is the biggest badass 
bird in the US because it creates so many problems. It is the number one agricultural problem. It's basically the number one aviation problem too as well. If we can do anything with these birds, then that's a huge benefit to society. So what we did was we set up an experiment where we had flocks of starlings. They could go to one end of the cage to get their food. They could go to the other end to get food too as well. And then at one end, we used the parametric speakers to broadcast a sound that, that overlapped completely with all of their vocalizations overlapped in terms of the frequency, the pitch of what they were doing. And what we found was that in this kind of experiment, we showed an almost halving of the amount of food that they would eat in the area that was affected by this sound. And this persisted for a reasonably long time. So this was very promising, but we need to take that out into a field situation and see what happens to starlings and other birds that we're concerned about in terms of this kind of manipulation. And that's the next step that we did, is we went out to one of the local airfields I can't actually tell you which one it is. I'm not allowed to. But we went to a local airfield, and we put out these speakers and played it for a month and looked to see the long-term effects of this kind of sound. And actually, before I get to that, what should I should say about the starlings is we also learned that the reason why they weren't eating the food as much under the sound is that when you present some kind of startle stimulus or an alarm that birds give to each other, on a fairly regular basis, the bird will say, oh my goodness, and fly away. <laughs> That's a natural kind of thing. But under this, what we're calling the sonic net, which is this broadcast sound in a spatially controlled area, if the bird is under that influence and you play an alarm call, they just don't respond to the alarm call. They don't appear to hear it, which makes us think that if you do this in the wild, they're really going to be in trouble because nobody likes to be in a vulnerable situation out in the wild and not be able to listen out for any kind of threats. It's like us being in a pitch black room, yet you know there's a chainsaw murderer somewhere in the room. You don't want to be there. You'll go to the room with the lights on where you can get away from this person. So we did this in the field, broadcasting this sound in a controlled way over a specific area at an airfield, and we found a huge reduction in the presence of birds, 80%. That's the biggest reduction we've ever seen anyone report for any kind of technology, and this lasted for a whole month. No diminishing of the effects. Startle stimulus, you start losing, off, you know, just scaring type things, the propane can, you lose that after a few days. So that we're very, very encouraged by this. And so what we're doing is we're taking this now to different kinds of installations, to farms, because we want to protect crops in the US, but also in very vulnerable countries. We want to work with this, because if we can protect these kinds of crops, we can increase people's livelihoods as well as increase the food supply. The aviation industry is obviously very um, interested in this because bird strike is a multi-billion dollar type of industry that we need to try to remove these kinds of um, risks. It's also relevant to developing alternate energy because birds flying into wind turbines is currently a big regulatory barrier to putting up wind turbines in some areas. So if we can control where birds are going and where they're flying, which is what we're working on next, we can also try to lower the barriers to some of these developments, such as wind energy, but also solar energy too as well, because birds landing on a solar panel and you know, doing what birds do, they'll poop on a solar panel, that reduces the efficiency of that. There are also very large solar farms out in California that intensify the amount of energy and heat in those areas, and they bring in lots of wildlife, including the birds, and they get fried. And so can we displace the birds from those areas? And that's an important question from a conservation point of view, because there are some vulnerable populations of birds that are being affected by those types of installations. So it's not just about benefiting humans. It's also about benefiting the birds, too, as well. We've been stuck with this paradigm for several centuries. We basically stuck scarecrows out in fields and expected birds to be stupid. <laughs> and unfortunately, birds are not stupid. They know that this is a toothless threat to them. But if we can start to think more like a bird, this is one situation where being called bird-brained is a big compliment. Because if we can think and see the world and hear the world like a bird, then we can use what birds respond to as a way of decreasing these kinds of threats and beating these challenges that have faced us now for a couple of centuries, yet we still haven't been able to overcome them. Thank you.